Good morning. Uh, my name is Grzegorz Poniatowski, and uh, I'm a director of fiscal policy studies at CASE, who is a member of, of the Euroframe uh, network. And I'll have a pleasure of, uh, of chairing this, uh, this session. Uh, the uncertainties associated with uh, uh, climate change and climate policies have uh, multi-threaded and uh, far-reaching implications, which I'm sure that uh, today's presentations will show. Uh, and we'll have three presentations uh, today. Um, the first presentation of uh, Ulrich uh, Adam from University of Poznan will focus on uh, distributional impacts of climate policies. The second paper uh, proposes a method to measure um, the uh, risk, uh, um, uh, to measure um, uh, shocks to transition risk. Whereas the third paper uh, draws the line between, um, between climate uh, changes and the economic growth based on, on the UK uh, regions. Um, let me also introduce uh, Gerdine Mayring, who will be uh, who will be providing introduction and uh, discussing, providing introduction for further discussion and discuss uh, the papers. Few, few orga organizational remarks uh, in front. I will ask uh, presenters to, uh, uh, to, to, to stick to timing, which is uh, 15 up to 20 minutes for each presentation. Then uh, we'll move uh, to the discussant and uh, we'll be left with at least 15 minutes for taking questions from the audience. If you have any questions in the meanwhile, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, write them down in the chat and we'll uh, address them uh, at, at the very end. Thank you very much. And with our, without uh, further ado, uh, Ulrich, the floor is yours. Thank you, Greg. Um... Yes, thanks all for having me. Let me try to share my slides. I hope everyone can see them now. I'll put them on full screen. So yes, um, as Greg already said, the topic of my presentation is uh, um, or are the distributional implications of climate policies with a particular focus on the role of uncertainty in this context. And yes, to briefly motivate yeah, this research uh, question or this research field, um, I think we can all agree on uh, the fact that market-based climate policy instruments are, an impor are important to achieve a timely decarbonization of economic activity. And there's a long debate about the design and choice of policy instruments. So um, the classical question is whether to use quantity or price instruments. And dating back to the old seminal paper of Weizmann, we all know that uh, uncertainty can play a crucial role here if we have to choose between instruments and can determine the, uh, the optimal choice of instruments. And this has also been picked up in more recent literature uh, on yeah, the growing field of uh, environmental DSGE models. So uh, introduced into a general equilibrium perspective, uh, taking all the dynamics into account. And uh, these yeah, early research here has shown that it's definitely important to take uh, the macroeconomic implications of these policy instruments into account. So they have large effects on macroeconomic stability, volatility, also welfare. We also know that uh, the effects differ between sectors, so there's substantial heterogeneity in the effects of climate policies across sectors. And uh, a little bit more recently, it also came on the agenda that um, one should take yeah, the presence of economic frictions and rigidities into account when assessing these different instruments. So uh, importantly here are, uh, or particularly important are nominal rigidities, so price setting frictions when firms cannot fully adjust to exogenous events and these inefficiency then uh, have yeah, strong effects on the welfare implications of the different instruments. We also know that yeah, the choice of instruments can also affect the way in which uh, international shocks are transmitted between open economies, so there's uh, lots of room for debate here. And um, besides this, um, it's also well known that yeah, climate policies exert distributional effects, which are generally found to be rather regressive. So putting a larger burden on 
poorer households. However, uh, recent meta-analysis has shown that these effects or these results uh, crucially depend on the specific context um, of the analysis and also uh, are subject to the methodology or depend on the methodology that has been applied. And there's no clear-cut consensus about the yeah, overall direction of these effects and about different channels. Um, one issue that has uh, not been addressed in this literature I've mentioned before are also uh, aspects of uh, climate policy introducing additional uncertainty into the macroeconomic uh, analysis or framework. Because as probably Rick uh, van Plöck had uh, shown us uh, yesterday in, uh, in his uh, talk, there's a substantial scientific uncertainty about the true underlying carbon budget. This is that is available. So there are different estimates about 300 gigatons or 400 um, and we don't know exactly. And this scientific uncertainty about the true carbon budget then also creates uncertainty for firms um, about the future time path of uh, climate policies, which might yeah, cause additional welfare costs or uh, also affect uh, macroeconomic volatility itself. Furthermore, there's also this technological uncertainty about the future abatement poss possibilities of firms or the possibilities of carbon capture. And this uh, also affects firms' decisions and um, yeah, might play a crucial role. And I would argue it does uh, um, because yeah, if you want to have a, a sound design of climate policy instruments, then we should take all these aspects into account. And that's what I try to do here or try to start with. I, I will provide with a macroeconomic assessment of these of different policy instruments, in particular classical carbon tax compared to a cap and trade system and an intensity target. There will also be a flexible pricing instrument, but it's less important here. And I will yeah, show you some results about volatility and welfare. And I will particularly focus on these distributional effects. And um, I do this in a way with credit constraint households. So um, it's an extreme case, but this will already offer some interesting insights into this matter. Um, finally, this will also yeah, capture some novel aspects of uh, specific adjustment frictions, particularly labor market rigidities. And I will try to take this uncertainty about carbon budgets and emission intensity into account. So, before going into more details, uh, let me briefly line out the approach. Um, all the uh, following analysis will be based on a standard new Canadian dynamic uh, stochastic general equilibrium model um, with two types of households, Ricadian and non-Ricadian households. So Ricadian households are generally the, the standard representative households we are all familiar with, and non-Ricadian households are credit constraints and can only consume their available funds every period. So they're not accumulating any wealth. And the model will feature wage rigidities besides the other rigidities that are known to be quite important in this, in this context. And um, all these analysis will be based or will then provide a quantitative assessment um, for the German economy. So the, the numerical model will be uh, calibrated to match stylized facts of the German economy. Uh, to sum up the results briefly, um, obviously I find that these policy instruments will differ in terms of their macroeconomic implications. So there will be different effects on macroeconomic stability, welfare, and uh, also uh, in terms of their distributional implications. In general, price instruments, so the classical standard text seems to be um, preferable in terms of welfare and volatility and exerts a rather neutral effect in terms of distributional implications while quantity instruments, the cap and trade in particular, we um, tend to exert regressive effects here. And what I will then examine are different uh, design options of policy instruments. And they can be shown that these options can help to um, yeah, mitigate these distributional effects. And um, finally, regarding this role of uncertainty in this context, we will see that um, yeah, uncertainty about the budget or the technological possibilities can have uh, substantial effects on the macroeconomic level. So for reason of time, I'll probably skip most of the uh, 
derivation of the model and just um, give you the, the main facts. So these two types of households will supply labor as it is common in this general equilibrium framework. And in that way, um, they, they supply labor to a union which uh, gives rise to uh, yeah, price or wage setting power of uh, workers or labor suppliers. And this also uh, motivates a kind of wage rigidity. So uh, labor markets will not clear all the time. That's a crucial feature here. Another important feature are, is the presence of non ricadian households. So they can only consume the income and that implies that they have a marginal propensity co to consume of one. And yet this uh, then has direct implications for overall aggregate dynamics, but also helps us to assess yeah, distributional implications in that sense. Um, pollution will be created on the production side here and um, introduced wire um, firms that employ uh, polluting intermediate input as in Fisher and Springborn. So this is a well-known approach in the literature. And yes, regarding the public sector, um, I just have to say that it's kept as simple as possible. So there will be independent monetary policy conducted by a central bank and a government uh, sector that has a balanced budget all the time or, and, or a stable debt trajectory. And then in this framework, I will compare these different instruments in terms of their macroeconomic implications. So yes, maybe just to highlight a few specific ingredients here on the household side, um, there are several types of uncertainty in the model. So besides these technological and carbon budget uncertainty, there will also be a demand shocks resembling some kind of time preference shock on the household side labor supply shocks and investment efficiency shocks, which are all known to be relatively important uh, explanations for the observed dynamics of emissions uh, across the along the business cycle. So um, these might play a role. We also have investment adjustment costs, which uh, clearly play an important role if you want to compare effects that emerge as a result of factor adjustments, then um, we might take into, uh, we might want to take into account that uh, um, input factors cannot adjust instantaneously. So we have sluggish adjustments here. Yes, this uh, union framework then also gives rise to this wage inertia and wages cannot adjust instantaneously, which is important in the same way as these investment adjustment costs because um, it levels the playing fields be between these two input factors, capital and labor. And if markets cannot clear instantaneously, this can be important for the firm's uh, factor employment decisions, as we will learn. And yes, that's the production side. One specific feature here is the way how I introduce um, these uncertainty about emission intensity, which you can see from the equation in the middle, where this phi ET captures uh, yeah, stochastic uh, um, mapping between emissions and the utilization of this polluting input factor. And uh, in that way, we can yeah, take this uh, uncertainty to the data or take uh, or estimate this uh, uncertainty empirically and use the empirical estimates in the, in the model to assess the role of these uncertainties about emission intensity. The rest of the firm problem is pretty much standard. So firms minimize costs and obviously try to maximize profits or dividends. And they also face a price setting problem. Here uh, on this slide, it's important to see the way in which climate policies will affect firms' decisions. So all these climate, climate policies will show up in this uh, P term at the right side of the marginal cost equation. And um, while all different instruments will show up there in the same way, um, their effects will differ because um, they have different implications for the dynamics of uh, carbon or emission prices, if you want so, even if the emission target is identical across the scenarios. And yes, this brings me then to the set of instruments that we are examining here. Um, the classical price instruments might just call it a tax. Um, it's a constant, a flexible price instrument um, can, to some extent, yeah, address the question whether 
climate policy should be designed uh, anti-cyclical or pro-cyclically, because uh, this has been a topic in the in the literature before, and um, in that way we can capture a carbon price that adjusts if emissions deviate from some exogenously defined target. Um, the, the cap and trade uh, is standard and there's a fixed number of emission permits that is available to firms. So now I see that I'm running out of time. So as I said, government sector and central bank are pretty much standard. And uh, yes, there are also more types of uncertainty. So there are government spending shocks and monetary policy shocks as well. Um, the calibration is based on data for German economy between 1991 and 2015. And as I said before, I estimate this emission intensity shock based on quarterly data on German CO2 emissions and um, fit it with an AR, AR1 model to match the underlying stochastic process in the theoretical model. And carbon budget uncertainty is uh, computed in two different ways, but the results do not differ too much. So we see that there are uh, deviations in the available carbon budget between five and 10%. So now the scenario analysis will um, show a 10% emission reduction relative to a business as usual, no policy scenario. And um, in the benchmark scenario, all the revenues that are generated through these instruments will be absorbed from the economy. And this will help us later to see or compare different revenue recycling schemes and the implications of those. Um, to speed things up a bit, I mean, the dynamics are definitely interesting, but not too different from the standard dynamics uh, evolving in a new Canadian model. Um, probably the most important thing here is that all these instruments show the largest differences in terms uh, of impulse responses. Um, if you look at emissions and pri the price of emissions, uh, all the other variables are more or less uh, comparable. There are only quantitative differences in their behavior. Um, it's relatively similar for the emission intensity shock. And yes, let's get to the results. So. Um, these results are based on a second order approximation of the HP filtered uh, theoretical moments of the model, so they're relatively uh, robust, uh, more robust than uh, obtained from simulations. And um, as we can see, the model provides a relatively good fit of German data, uh, probably in terms of uh, um, emissions. The fit is not that good, but it seems to be a general problem in, in these, for these type of models. Um, what we can learn from this comparison of macroeconomic stability is that the price instrument uh, is associated with the smallest increase in macroeconomic volatility. And the cap and trade system would introduce a lot of substantial, uh, substantially more volatility into the system. So from that perspective, one might argue that the price instrument can work stabilizing here. The welfare effects and also split it up for these two type of households already um, are uh, going into the same direction. So again, we see that price instruments tend to be preferable. And also we see that the welfare loss for the poorer households is a little bit, it's marginally smaller than the welfare loss for Ricadian households. All these figures, of course, depend crucially on the underlying parameter values. And I've run several robustness set checks and um, Yes, I, that's why I wouldn't say that it's a progressive effect on the, on the price instrument. But what we can see here is that the quantity instruments, so the cap and trade and intensity target, uh, clearly are exert regressive effects. So the welfare losses are larger on the side of uh, the poorer households. And to understand where these effects come from, we can take a, a quick look at the differences in macroeconomic volatility in factor incomes and income shares and in the uh, in individual consumption. What we can see here is that um, under the cap and trade system, we see a large increase in volatility of factor shares, of both factor shares, and in particular, the volatility of uh, consumption increases substantially. And this is the, the reason why we see these large welfare effects for the poorer households, while Ricadian households are able to uh, 
smooth their consumption in these type of models, non-Ricadian households cannot do so. And these larger fluctuations in income will directly map into their in fluctuations of their consumption. And this then can explain the yeah, welfare effects. So the welfare effects are also driven by price rigidities and labor market rigidity. And um, generally there's a tendency that um, labor market rigidity uh, decreases the uh, welfare effects um, or the welfare losses of poorer household because the more rigid the labor market will be, um, the, the less uh, volatile price or uh, wages will be. And this kind of stable tends to stabilize their income. And that's why they kind of prefer really rigid labor markets. So it's a, a bit uh, yeah, puzzling result in some sense, but from a modeling perspective, perfectly makes sense here. Um, yes, different revenue recycling schemes have a huge potential to alleviate these regressive effects. And as we can see, we can even uh, generate progressive effects of uh, environmental policies. And this could uh, be the case if we use a transfer scheme and a tax cut and a spending scheme, for example, can also mitigate the effects, but still tends to be regressive. But under a transfer scheme, on, considering only the sources side effects of environmental policies or climate policies, um, the, the full transfer can definitely mitigate all these yeah, distributional effects associated with climate policies. So this then brings me to the last topic, which I think I will have to skip, but uh, let me just say that, um, yes, uncertainty about the carbon budget plays a, a crucial role. And in particular, it's important uh, how policy adjusts to new information about the carbon budget and how these adjustments of policy tools are phased in then. So from a welfare perspective, it might be favorable to phase it in um, via a hoteling scheme, while in contrast, um, this, this will lead to much more uh, uh, additional emissions over the phase-in period, while an attack phase-in is associated with the largest uh, decline in output and welfare, of course, and that can stabilize uh, yeah, emissions the best. So, um, yes, I think I'm out of time, and I just want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation and being conscious of time. Uh, now uh, we'll, we'll turn to Philippe Zank, the co-author of the paper titled uh, uh, Shocks to Transition Risk. Philippe, the, the floor is yours. Yes, yeah, sorry, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Well done, could you? Perfect. So thank you for the uh, kind introduction. Uh, let me start my presentation. So do you see my slides? Yes. OK, perfect. So uh, thank you so much for hosting us today. It's my great pleasure to present uh, our paper, Shocks to Transition Risk, which is a joint work with uh, Christoph Meinerding and Yves Schüler, both at Deutsche Bundesbank. So what is this about? Um, as you know, an established way to think about risks stemming from climate change is the distinction between physical risks and transition risks. Um, physical risks are, for example, like more frequent extreme weather events, heat waves, hurricanes, you name it. While transition risks describe uh, risks that are coming from the process of adjusting towards a lower carbon economy. So for example, phasing out carbon intensive industries like oil or coal and how this process will affect the economy at large. So why did we choose, choose transition risk for our paper? Well, I mean, there's a large literature on physical risks um, concerning climate change, both in the natural and in the social sciences. But we don't really know that much about transition risks. In particular, we kind of lack a precise definition of what transition risk actually is. At least we don't have anything from, from major policymakers on, on that. And also, this concept is relatively more abstract than physical risk. So measuring it precisely is significantly more challenging. 
And that's exactly where we come in. So we propose a, a new method to measure shocks to transition risk, which we define as instances of uh, significant new information on possible transition paths of the economy. Our methodology combines two approaches. First, we look at the differential pricing of green and brown firms using portfolio methods to identify events that are market relevant. And second, we look at news regarding climate change in conjunction with economics. And I'll talk about why we think that we need both approaches, which basically boils down to a robustness issue. As a result, we'll get a time series of shocks to transition risk, which we'll then use uh, in a standard macro financial VAR model to analyze the impacts of these shocks on the macroeconomy. Okay, so uh, let me talk a little bit more about how uh, we identify our shocks. So as I've said, uh, we uh, combine portfolio sorts with textual analysis. So portfolio sorts is fairly standard approach here. We sort our stock return data into long short portfolios according to carbon footprint. This is a widely used method, of course, perhaps less so in the context of climate finance, but important papers to cite here are uh, Park Monk 2019, as well as Wilkins et al. 2019. Um, a benefit of this approach is that the sign of our long short portfolio returns are actually informative for our, for our purposes. Huh? So we can use this information to determine the sign of our climate uh, transition shock. We then combine this with textual analysis. So uh, we, we uh, use a very simple approach where we simply count the number of articles mentioning uh, climate change and uh, economics or economy. Huh? So this is kind of related to uh, an approach found in the paper by Robert Engel et al, 2019. The main difference is that we include uh, the terms economics or economy explicitly in our searches while uh, they uh, do not. So kind of we, we try, not, try to ensure that, that we count only articles that are really relevant for, for the study. Of course, the main concern in any such exercise is uh, robustness. I mean, there, there are many degrees of freedom in, in, in particular because transition risk itself is not strongly defined. So either approach on its own, at least we believe, is not stable enough to produce reliable results. If we only used portfolio sorts, then we'd uh, run into uh, trouble regarding data availability and noisiness of data. So, uh, as you might know, ESG data, we took that from, from Thomson Reuters icon. Uh, data availability here is, is quite, quite low. Quality itself might also be questionable, uh, at least partially. Um, it is often unclear how, these, uh, how reliable these values are. Are they self-reported? Is there any official source? Um, also, I guess it's a fact of life. Stock market returns are very noisy and driven by many other latent factors that we don't uh, account for in our model. So there may be many, many false positive when using only portfolio sorts. On the other hand, if we only use textual analysis, then we wouldn't really know if the news that we observe is actually relevant. So there might be that we have much news on climate change and on economics, but nothing happens on the stock market. So and it is unlikely that uh, such a scenario would constitute a shock to transition risk. Also, this would allow us to, um, to filter out uh, anticipated events. So, so events that have already been foreseen by market participants and hence do not uh, induce a shock in the market. So a good example for that would be for the uh, withdrawal of the United States from the Paris Agreement under, under the Trump administration. On top of that, um, so a benefit of, 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 our, of our dual approach is that we can get a certain context for our shocks. So by, by, by reading the newspapers and knowing what's going on at the moment, we can be a lot more certain that our events actually are exogenous to, to the economy. Furthermore, as a, as a small tangent, uh, this, this duality kind of can be interpreted as, as a possible split between uh, risk neutral and physical expectations in terms of asset pricing. So portfolio shocks would, would uh, represent changes in risk neutral expectations, while news shocks would uh, be more indicative of, of, of changes in physical expectations. So let me talk how we uh, construct our portfolio sorts in detail. So we take uh, ESG data from Thomson Reuters Icon, we merge them with the Chris Contestat database for stock returns. 
We do then two portfolio sorts. Um, the first one on carbon or carbon equivalent emissions, and the second one on energy usage. And then we apply a standard uh, asset pricing machine machinery. So we form value weighted decile portfolios, which are annually rebalanced and compute the pharma fringe free factor residuals for our portfolio returns and convert them into a monthly long short uh, return time series. So one for carbon and one for energy. For robustness, we also add a third portfolio from the literature. Uh, this is the brown minus green portfolio from Gergen and Al 2020. Uh, Marco Wilkins, who is one of the co-authors here, was so kind as to provide us with the uh, time series for, for this project here. Um, a small comment here concerning uh, our, our sample time frame. So, um, as I've already mentioned, data availability for ESG is uh, yeah, leaves a lot of a lot of things to be desired. So, if we go, for example, back to 2005, we found roughly 100 firms for which carbon uh, emission data were available, and roughly 50 firms for energy use, usage. This is clearly suboptimal for any asset pricing portfolio sorting exercise. Um, so in the end, we, we uh, kind of uh, followed a similar path uh, as uh, Gergen and Al and started our sample in 2010, where we have uh, roughly 300 firms for carbon and 200 firms for emissions, uh, for, for energy usage. And of course, this number is uh, monotonically increasing as we go forward in time. Our news index uh, is constructed with the help of the Factiva news database. So it's a major a repository of news articles from all around the globe. We use articles from 10 major US newspapers, including the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. And we use uh, key search phrases, climate change and economic or economy. So we have uh, like this, this context of uh, economic relevance here. We then standardize uh, article counts with the number of articles about uh, economics uh, in general. So we want to filter out effects due to changes in volume of economics articles. So, and finally, we also detrend this time series as it has a clear upwards trend. And I guess that's not particularly surprising as uh, climate change has become much more important in the public discourse over the past decade. So for that, we, we simply apply a simple uh, HP filter to eliminate this trend. Perhaps an observation, we uh, found in our research that this news index is very robust to changes in dictionaries. So we, we tried a whole host of, of different, more complicated dictionaries containing vocabulary from uh, a, a canon of climate change literature, and the results were basically the same. So all the indices are highly correlated, uh, 98, 99%. So I guess our message here would be, if we want to do something similar, keep it simple, climate change uh, yields already uh, uh, basically most of the results. So, so uh, in the end, uh, we end up with this picture here. So the red line here is our detrended and standardized climate news index. The spikes that you see here uh, are indicative of something going on in the uh, climate change news cycle, if you will. Huh? Um, the shocks that we then identify are based on a co-exceedance approach. So these are months where both our filtered news index is one standard deviation above its mean, and where at least one of our three portfolios is one standard deviation above or below its mean. So we capture uh, months where there is an extreme, uh, extremely high uh, uh, amount of climate change news in an economics context, as well as where markets reacted uh, uh, very strongly, either in the positive or the negative. Huh? The solid lines here indicate events where the long short returns are negative, so brown firms are underperforming, which we interpret as, as an increase in transition risk, while the dashed lines here uh, stand for positive returns of our portfolio, so green firms are underperforming, which we then uh, interpret as a decrease in transition risk. Okay, so uh, this is how we identify our shocks. Um, I suggest we move on to do some economic analysis with that.
So we convert our shocks into a time series. We start with uh, like a series of dummy variables where a one indicates a month with a positive transition risk shock and a minus one is a negative transition risk shock with zero everywhere else. Huh? We then scale this time series uh, with the value of our news index in that specific month, which allows us to incorporate the magnitude of these shocks into our analysis. We then built a, a small standard macrofinancial VR, uh, eight variables, a small model of the economy. So we have industrial production, consumption, prices, uh, slope of the yield curve, as well as uh, conditions on the credit market with the uh, excess bond premium by, by Gilchrist and Zakrajek, as well as uh, some other stock market uh, variables. So, so um, as a result of, of this model, um, we see here the impulse responses for uh, a positive shock to transition risk. We see that industrial production in the United States, although this is all US data, of course, uh, industrial production decreases quite a bit after a positive shock to transition risk. Um, this decrease is also fairly persistent. We see um, a, a decrease in slope um, of the term structure and also an increase in credit risk premium on the bond market. Huh? We also have an increase in the VIX, so I guess more uh, aggregate uncertainty and uh, also lower stock market returns in general. So all of these effects together for us at least are kind of indicative of uh, positive shocks to transition risks being uh, contractionary. They increase financial stress and risk premium. We also have uh, a whole host of uh, other results that show that our shocks explain uh, between 20 to 30% of total variation in industrial production and the excess bond premium. We see a pronounced asymmetry between positive and negative shocks. So in the sense that uh, if we plot the impulse responses for negative shocks, they are not just uh, sign inverted uh, from, from the positive uh, responses, but rather they are much uh, less strong, uh, partially not quite significant. Huh? Furthermore, um, the effects on sectoral industrial production match our priority expectations. So in particular energy materials, uh, industrial production takes a major hit and becomes significantly more volatile after a positive TR shock. So volatility in sense of, of stock market uh, movement. Huh? Finally, we also included uh, the sub indices of the National Financial Conditions Index, which is uh, published by the uh, uh, Chicago Fed weekly. Uh, this index um, measures financial conditions and stress on financial markets, and the sub indices simply measure where that stress is coming from. So we have uh, credit, leverage, uh, non financial leverage, and, uh, and risk. Yeah. Um, and as a result, we observe uh, after a positive TR shock an increase in the national financial conditions credit sub index. So credit conditions tighten after a positive TR shock but there's no real risk or leverage. So this kind of mirrors the uh, uh, response that we've seen from the excess bond premium here. So uh, for the sake of brevity, I, I won't present those this, this results in detail, but I invite you to look at our paper where we present those uh, uh, far more, uh, far greater detail. Good, so um, we are currently in the midst of extending this analysis for the other G7 countries. So we have already constructed our news indices using Factiva. We have also switched uh, from Thomson Reuters icon data to ISS data. Um, we have run our portfolio sorts and we've already got some preliminary results here. And right now we are uh, building the VAR models uh, for every G7 country. The data already has been collected for that and we hope to get uh, good results for that by the end of this month. And of course, uh, as a work in progress, we are still looking to re further robustify our approach, especially we want to show that our methodology, our dual methodology produces better results than simpler approaches. Uh, so basically we want to justify this additional complexity that we have. So in conclusion, we presented a method to identify transition risk shocks using a combination of uh, textual analysis and portfolio source. 
we use this combination in order to reduce degrees of freedom and to robustify our approach. We find that shocks to transition risk have a significant impact uh, on aggregate and sectoral variables, and they also affect financial stability. And also finally, we um, observe a pronounced asymmetry between positive and negative shocks to transition risk. Okay, so uh, with that, I'd really like to conclude my presentation. Thank you so much for your kind attention, and I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards. Thank, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting presentation. And before I give the floor to Sandra, I wanted to, to repeat warm encouragement to, to write your questions on the chat while, while uh, speaker. Uh, Sandra Button uh, from the uh, Bank of England with the paper, The Impact of the Weather on the UK Economy. Sandra, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Greg. Uh, thank you for uh, having me here. It's, it's a great pleasure uh, to be presented at this conference uh, today. Uh, my work is um, based at the Bank of England, and, and so I would uh, please uh, note this disclaimer that the views expressed today are only my views and do not represent the Bank of England or any of its three policy committees. Um, so as Philippe has usefully me has mentioned already, there are um, physical risks from climate change. So we typically think of them as uh, two types, either the chronic risks are um, long-term changes in the first moment to some of the uh, climate quantities, in particular increasing temperature and uh, precipitations and their effect as uh, increased sea uh, level rises. Um, there's also an acute uh, kind of uh, effects of climate change, which is increasing the variability of these uh, uh, quantities. So uh, increasing extreme weather events and um, the consequences. Um, so there, there is uh, a quite an extensive literature already, the climate economy literature that, that looks at impact of um, climate on the economy. Um, the motivation for this is to have a first step by looking at uh, a specific country, the UK, um, using uh, past data on temperature and precipitation. Um, as mentioned in Cannes and others, there are very few examples of single country studies. Um, and so this was an, um, a first step at this. Uh, I, I will claim that the understanding the impact of weather on the economy is important um, per se and, and beyond the implications for understanding climate change. So it's important to assessing um, the current state of the economy and, and for forecasting. So particularly also relevant for central bankers. So lo looking at the related literature, um, studies use weather data to infer climate impacts. So you can think of um, climate being a, a random variable with a given probability distribution. Uh, so climate change would uh, be consist of shifts in this distribution, uh, whereas weather, the weather is, um, you can think of the weather as the realization from this random distribution. Uh, and Xiang has a, a really nice paper where he describes the conditions under which using weather data to infer a climate impact is, um, is appropriate. There have been different uh, studies um, that most tend to find some evidence of economic impact. So Dell and Dell and others is just, um, and the, the kind of traditional one. Uh, they have a linear model of temperatures uh, on economic growth, and they find um, that this has positive, uh, negative impact on import countries. Uh, Burke and others use a nonlinear model, so reconcile the different results for. Um, rich and poor countries and find that um, this, this result is indeed non-linear and the, the, the growth rate of output peaks at 13 degrees Celsius and declines after that. And Kant and others um, look at longer term impacts and, and control for the endogeneity of climate. As I mentioned, uh, there are few single country studies or countries that look at industries. Uh, and, and one exception is the paper by Ricardo Colacito and co-author, which has been the um, inspiration for, for this work. Um, 
So they look at the impact of temperature on the US economy um, across the US uh, states. Um, so I'm using uh, economic data, economic growth data. Um, so I'm looking both at the UK aggregate. So on that, there are data available from the 18th century um, in a data set put together by, by the bank. Um, but the regional data uh, for the smallest regions in the UK, which is the 179 NAVS3 um, regions is only are only available from 1998. Um, the weather variables are from the UK Met Office. Um, I'm using uh, temperature in degrees Celsius and precipitation in centimeters. They're, again, they're really long time series. Um, and they both, I use both aggregate annual and seasonal averages as well as um, annual and seasonal averages for 10 UK climate regions. Um, so what I've done, I've mapped the uh, NAT3 regions into these uh, bigger, uh, broader climate regions. Um, so of course, climate data are available at a much um, smaller uh, geographical detail. And uh, ideally, one would want to map the NATS3 uh, regions to a smaller, their, their own um, geographical um, area. And this is something that I'm aiming to do in the next, um, in the future version of this work. So the empirical specification, when we look at the aggregate, we uh, regress uh, um, growth in uh, a log, um, uh, real uh, GDP on its lag variable and a, a T temperature or a precipitation variable. Um, and also when looking at different seasonal averages, I include a, the average for each of the four seasons, uh, winter, spring, um, summers and autumn, summer and autumn. Uh, when I look, use the regional panel, I look at the change in um, the log of G GVA for the uh, I regions. And I look at the temperature and precipitation for the broad uh, macro regions that include uh, lagged dependent variable, uh, and in, uh, a regional dummy and a, and a year dummy. So um, the, the main results, um, when, you when you include annual average temperatures, the effects tend to be not significant. So you can see from the first column, um, neither uh, using the time series nor the panel. So in this, in this regression, I've used the same uh, period 1998 to 2018 for comparison. But when you include the seasonal average temperature for the different seasons, then you start seeing some effects, at least in the panel. Um, so you see that the temperature is negative uh, effects on growth in the summer and autumn and precipitation in the uh, winter. So when, for, for, from this, you can already see that, that there is heterogeneity across uh, seasons and therefore uh, just looking at annual averages is not uh, satisfactory. Um, but the heterogeneity is even more evident when you look at temperatures across the impact across industrial sectors. Um, so this takes the regional panel and runs that regression separately for each of these um, industries, the broad uh, industry at the um, first digit uh, industrial classification, standard industrial classification. In the chart, um, the bar in the middle of the box represents the coefficient of the regression weighted by the um, share of GVA uh, of that industry in the total. The box represents the 90% confidence interval and the little line on top and the bottom represent the 95% confidence interval. So the bigger the box, um, the less precise the estimates are. I think what's really interesting from this picture is to see the heterogeneity across sectors and also how these effects change for each for the same sector uh, um, across different uh, seasons. So some, some examples are, are, are really interesting in particular, I think. So the real estate, for example, which I've um, colored in red here. So we know from, from literature that real estate has um, hot seasons. 
uh, summers and spring, typically. Um, these results show that those spring and summer hot seasons, um, that there is, no, there is no additional effect of temperatures in these reasons, in these seasons. Um, but but, but higher temperature in winter uh, boost output in the real estate sector, whereas high temperatures in autumn um, de de uh, decrease output in the real estate sector. So, so we think of these effects have been um, through different channels. Uh, some, some people have talked about labor productivity effects, so heat stress uh, negatively affecting labor productivity and therefore uh, the impact uh, on the economy. Um, th these kind of effects are um, depend on the activity that the sector performs. So sa some sectors uh, such, such as construction that are completely outdoors are more affected by the weather, but some other uh, um, activities such as real estate or, for example, um, wholesale and retail, which is in, in green in the bar, um, combine outdoor and indoor activities uh, and so also affected by changes in weather through uh, the effect on, on consumers um, and their um, response to weather effects. So, for example, for wholesale and retail in green, you see that hot springs uh, boost um, output in that sector, but hot, hot autumns depress it. Um, and also the orange bars are the um, arts and entertainment, which is also interesting. So uh, hot springs um, depress output in the art and entertainment where maybe venues are still indoors and people replace for outdoor activities. But in the summer, when you can uh, make use of outdoors venues, then uh, temperatures boost output. Um, the table also um, sums across this effect. Uh, so it's a weighted average across the sectors. Uh, so you can see that the overall effect appears to be positive of temperatures on the UK economy. Um, so the, the, the positive effect in winter and spring offset uh, the eff negative effects in the summer and autumn. And also you can think of these effects as um, being just a transi transitory. So as people shift activities from one season to the other in response to the weather. Um, However, you can think of this as uh, something that might change in the future, in particular, if temperatures uh, increase significantly. Um, the negative effects uh, in summer and autumn might e eventually um, overcome the positive effects. So a sort of economic tipping point, um, as opposed to the, the climate tipping point that we used to think about. And this is important because the um, UK temperature are temperatures are projected to grow um, in every month of the year significantly, and uh, over. The, so this is the, the the projection over the next uh, this current decade and the next, and they almost indistinguishable between the more benign scenario, the RCP 2.6, and the um, the more extreme scenario, the RCP 8.5. And this is because uh, even if we start a very aggressive climate policy now, some of the changes in the climate are already um, locked in. So I've done a similar exercise for precipitations. And again, you can see uh, how, for example, real estate again in red, the effects are uh, different depending on the season. Um, the uh, table shows the average effects. Uh, and again, uh, the positive impact uh, on, on the economic growth in the autumn seems to offset um, the negative impacts in the winter and summer. However, again, um, and in particular in this case, the negative impact in the winter uh, might be uh, become uh, worse in the future as precipitations are expected to grow, especially in the winter months. I also did an exercise to assess whether the results were um, indicating a growth of level effects and for temperature, this, the, 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 lag, the sum of the lag coefficient and the, uh, and the contemporaneous coefficient is what suggests um, whether it's a level of growth effect. And in the case of temperature, this sum of coefficients are, uh, is not significant, but in the case of precipitation, there is some suggestions that the winter and spring uh, negative effects have um, are persistent, so have a growth impact rather than just on the transitionary on the level. 
also looked at um, the regional results, so, so running the panel uh, of industries for each uh, macro region. Uh, and here again, I noticed the uh, wide heterogeneity of results. So one result I think it's interesting is that the, there's significant and, and uh, quite large effects of, of uh, temperatures on the southeast uh, and central south of England, so London and the area around it, uh, which is the, the the probably the hottest area of the UK. Uh, and this kind of reflects, in a sense, the results that Colachito and other finds for the US, find for the US, where they see that the negative impact of temperature in the summer is driven by the southern states. Um, so to conclude, uh, I had a first step at understanding the impact of weather on the UK economy uh, using um, seasonal and average in, in temperature and precipitation. And, looking at different uh, industrial sector and I find economic uh, statistically significant effects, although uh, small. Uh, I also find strong heterogeneity across seasons, industries and regions. So future work as well as having some, uh, um, doing some robustness uh, tests, I would like to construct a, a, a geographical measure for weather variables at the NAT3 level based on the um, more um, granular climate data. I would also like to in investigate the interaction between rainfall and temperatures. They often happen at the same time. Um, lower temperature and, and heavy precipitation snow um, can have, have a, an additional effect on, um, in addition to what they're separately their separate effect. So um, the next step would be to understand this interaction. And finally, um, rather than just looking at the at the, at the average effects, so looking at how um, the ch changes in temperature affect the extreme weather events. So, so looking more at the acute um, manifestation of climate change uh, rather than just the um, chronic ones. Um, so this is all from me. Uh, thank you very much for listening and um, um, uh, I would welcome any comments and questions. Sandra, thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I guess that with the, with the number of takeaways from the papers, Guardian had, uh, will have pleasant but quite difficult role to, um, to feed the 15 minutes time. So without further ado, Guardian, uh, floor is yours. Thanks, I'll start sharing my screen. Um, can you see my presentation? Yes, yes we do. Yes, great, okay. Right, uh, really interesting papers and it was uh, a real joy to, uh, uh, to read them and review them. Um, they're really different uh, with uh, very different approaches. So um, uh, Sandra's paper, uh, which was presented just now on the impact of the weather of UK economy uh, is an empirical paper using regressions and she uses regional climate data and industry output. Now, um, the paper that was presented by uh, Ulrich on the distributional implication of climate policies uses a two agent new Keynesian model and then finally, Philip uh, uh, presented uh, his paper to uh, shocks to transition risks, and they use a Bayesian structural uh, factor autoregression. So uh, really three different approaches. Um, is the, the order is, is a bit different. Uh, I, it's, it's just random. I'll, I'll start with Sandra's paper. Um, she really sorry, the, sorry, sorry to interrupt one, one thing i think we don't see slides moving and i oh. i see that uh, oh okay i see this do you now see the yes the yes thank you slides great <laughs> thanks for the for the heads up so uh this was uh what i just uh, presented and now i'll uh, go to um, uh, sandra's paper 
The question she asks is, what are the effects of seasonal weather, temperature and precipitation on economic growth? And then per region, per industry, uh, uh, within the time period uh, of uh, 1998 to 2020. And she uses the modeling strategy a la Colachito. Um, what she finds is uh, it depends, uh, and that uh, sounds quite quite uh, broad, um, but I find it really interesting um, that you really look at uh, which season, uh, which region, and which industry is is affected. Uh, for instance, rainy winters and springs uh, discourage shoppers, but rainy autumn encourages them. Um, rainy summers affect construction, but uh, the other seasons don't. So um, this is really, uh, really interesting, I find. Um, now my comments, well, it's a very simple and clear uh, paper, uh, and, and I'm looking forward to the, to the additions. Um, what I would like to see is more descriptives, and I just made a quick uh, uh, graph of, of the Met Office of the UK, and, and it really shows you that these are the maximum temperatures, <clears throat> uh, and summer is above and winter is uh, below. Uh, you, this is just drawn by ha hand, and, and I'm sure you can do this um, in, uh, in, in a much better way using statistical methods, but you really see the, the maximum temperatures rising. Or in, in both summer and winter. So I think the paper would become uh, uh, a bit richer using uh, uh, maybe graphs, but it can also be in, in descriptives. Um, another comment is what are the implications of your findings? Uh, so we see that uh, uh, climate change is really impacting uh, industries in various regions, but what does it mean for the regions and what does it mean for the industries? Is there government policy needed or not? Or are the effects still so small uh, that no action is needed? And I was also thinking in future effects with more and more climate change. Um, of course, there is a, a relationship between in industry activities and weather, for instance, tourism. Um, and if there's more climate change, if, if uh, regions and, and industries are really impacted, will you see activities move between regions? So uh, yeah, the, as the paper is now, the conclusion is discussions are quite short, but I think uh, there, there are many uh, uh, topics that can be discussed. Then the uh, second paper presented by Philip, um, uh, no, sorry, by, by, by Ulrich, uh, the distributional implication of climate policy on this uncertainty asked the question, what are the short run implications of emission reduction schemes on the German economy? And it uses a two agent, a new Keynesian model. Now, there are four instruments, uh, two price instruments and uh, two sort of quantity instruments. And what they find is that actually price instruments are preferred, which I found interesting because the cap and trade uh, uh, scheme is, is, is quite popular. Uh, and they say, well, price instruments are to be preferred because it leads to higher aggregate welfare, leads to neutral to moderately progressive distribution effects, and results in lower volatility in output and consumption. And quantitative effects, for instance, cap and trade, uh, actually leads to um, uh, regressive distributional effects, loss of uh, wealth for households, for instance. And it entails large costs of adjustment, adjustment and changes in climate policies. So because the model is so key uh, uh, to the paper and, and really drives the results, uh, my comments uh, mostly uh, focus on, on the tank model. Uh, and I also asked uh, some input from a colleague um, on, the, uh, on the second one. Um, now, a two-agent tank model has two agents, one who is completely hand-to-mouth and does not save, and one who does save, and in this case, and owns the entire capital stock. Um, so the distribution of wealth is trivial, uh, and it's not possible to include wealth uh, inequality. So is that why you uh, include income inequality? 
Another uh, is that the assumption that both agents work the same number of hours and there's one wage that is determined by a union. Um, this means that the change in inequality is therefore determined by changes in the marginal product of capital. Um, and is this empirical relevant in the case of distributions and climate policies? Then um, uh, the solution method, the second order perturbation, well, this can be imprecise, but this applies to all perturbation techniques. And the uncertainty by construction will have limited effect compared to higher order approximations. Then the, uh, the third paper, Shocks to Transition Risk, uh, presented by Philip. Um, this says, this sort of uh, uh, postulates that government policies or new technologies or changed household preferences relate to climate change a result. <clears throat> related to climate change, sorry, results in a process of adjustment towards an economy with lower carbon emissions. So this is what we see uh, currently. And uh, they say, well, this will impact green and brown firms by making certain industries, firms of products obsolete. And they label this transition risks. Now there are positive shocks to transition risks, which are sort of new economic news or information on climate change that impacts the valuation of brown firms differently from green firms, if I understood the paper correctly. Um, so they analyze this, uh, the, the economic effect of these uh, transition risks with the macrofinancial BVAR framework. Um, and they construct uh, what I find a really interesting uh, uh, a data set, which is new. What they find is that actually positive transition risk shocks do have effects. Uh, they have three effects, significantly lower the economic outlook, it deteriorates credit conditions, and it causes a decline in the industrial production of climate sensitive sectors like energy materials. And um, in opposition of that, negative transition shocks have no discernible effects. So my comments, are, uh, well, you use the terms risk and uncertainty in the paper without making really clear what the difference is. And uh, I guess we all know the work of uh, Knight that, who says that risks, you do know the outcome, uh, you do not know the outcome, but you can measure the odds. Uh, but uncertainty is you do not out know the outcome and there's no information to calculate the odds. The second is, and this, I may have, have uh, misunderstood the paper, but how do you avoid imposing a cause effect relationship uh, by requiring that shocks are due to new information and construction of a database that links news with extreme portfolio returns? So you, it's, it's almost like cherry picking. Um, another comment in the uh, conclusion discussion, you say that policymakers should constantly communicate the results mo uh, most likely transition path, which I agree with, of course, but then which policymakers? Because Republicans and Democrats will uh, have very different uh, uh, transition paths and uh, will, will give also different uh, information. So it's, it's really difficult to avoid. The broader set of countries, I'm really interested in, in seeing the results because I was thinking, are small countries feasible? I was thinking of my own country, the Netherlands, uh, and how uh, are firms impacted by global news uh, uh, and, and how do multinationals, for instance, uh, um, uh, how, how are multinationals uh, like Shell affected? Okay, I'll leave it uh, uh, with this. Let me see how I get back. Karin, thank you. Thank you very much for your, for your points. And uh, I will ask um, uh, the speakers to, to follow the order that you had in your presentation. But before, before that, uh, let me also uh, read two questions. Actually, one question and one remark uh, for Philip. Uh, Ulrich asks uh, whether uh, the weather conditions were also taken uh, into account uh, in the construction uh, of shocks, because this 
this is uh, this is the the, um, the question and the remark uh, from uh, from Mr. Hernandez um, uh, for specifically for period 2016 and 2017 and possible um, um, possible shocks to trade uh, policy uncertainty related to Trump inauguration. There's a remark possibly may also want to uh, develop on that, but uh, let us uh, start with, uh, with Sandra. Sandra, over to you. Ah, thank you, Greg. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, um, and thank you uh, very much, Gerdin, for your um, comments um, and discussion. Um, so I agree, um, there is so much more I want <laughs> to put in this paper, um, in particular on the extremes. Uh, so I've only looked at averages, but the, the chart you showed about extreme temperature is, is in particular one of the uh, kind of extreme weather events driven by climate change that we are um, particularly subject to in the UK. So um, we, we, in separate work, we identify extreme weather, extreme temperatures, floods, and uh, windstorms as as the three um, kind of weather events that UK is more uh, vulnerable to. Uh, so definitely, there's more scope uh, for including more analysis uh, on the implications. Um, being um, at the central bank, the there is uh, no role for for the central bank in in policy. Um, climate policy, we we don't have any role, and 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 it feels um, really um, overstepping when when thinking of giving you know policy climate policy implications. Uh, so I was I wasn't going to go there. And my motivation for this paper was that um, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence about the fact that climate um, would not have major impacts on the UK, you know, in terms of physical events that there's a lot of climate models and and whenever you look at their global uh, you know charts the uk is always very pale is never doesn't never have huge impacts and and i think um and this is not helpful uh for 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 our thinking um so so my so i wanted to highlight how there are impacts they might look small for now um, they might well become more important and and for us it's important to understand um, where they are and and definitely there will be shifts in activity across regions and across seasons and and we cannot understand them and, and factor them into our forecast and our understanding of the economy uh, if we don't model them um, so, so, so that was my my main motivation. Uh, the conclusions are yes. Now we can't yet see impacts, uh, negative impacts of weather on the economy, um, but we don't know when these might change. Um, the, the the economic tipping points are are have a di are in different time frames compared to the climate tipping points. Uh, so I think it's something uh, important um, to keep in mind. Um, and, and so for, for us, anything that affects the economy uh, is, is important to understand. Uh, and, and, and I think we, you know, there's, there's scope for doing more um, analysis of climate impacts, even in the short mid to medium term, which are uh, more relevant for the, the central banks and, and the forecast, its forecast horizon. And that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you. Then following the order, over over to you. Yeah. First of all, thank you for the the comments, and uh, maybe let me start with the second remark you phrased um, regarding the yeah, role of employment decisions in the model. So um, maybe it didn't really get clear because I was uh, lacking some time. But uh, the the point is that. Uh, households tend to work uh, the same amount of hours in the initial equilibrium, but uh, in the subsequent or so after implementation of policies, the, the labor supply decision of the Ricadian and non Ricadians, uh, Ricadian households in the model can differ. And it will differ, and that's also part um, of the effect or explaining the effect that um, yeah, those households have to work more or there's a tendency that they have to work more to compensate the lower income in order to stabilize their um, 
their consumption in contrast to the Ricadian households who have also a capital income. And this then leads me also to the, to the other remark regarding the types of inequality. So um, I, I view this type of model as a, yeah, as a benchmark. It's uh, really capturing a polar case with uh, one household owning the whole capital stock of the economy, all the assets, while the other household is completely wealth poor. And therefore it has some notion of uh, wealth inequality as well, I would argue, because um, that's also the reason then for the evolving uh, income inequality uh, that is resulting from the fact that one group of households has no capital incomes. And that's also the crucial aspect that the model is highlighting that one has to take into account these yeah, factor specific income effects of climate policies. So when designing climate policies, one should carefully uh, account for potential labor market rigidities, capital market rigidities, and take into account that there are households that might be particularly affected from climate policy because of their economic situation. And um, doing so can help uh, to improve yeah, the yeah, the general support or the broad support for these type of measures. And that's why I want uh, yeah, to highlight these, these aspects in the analysis. Of course, it would be much better if one could uh, use a fully fledged heterogeneous agent model with a full distribution of, of all types of households. But uh, given these uh, difficulties in solving these numerical models, it's not really feasible, at least uh, at the moment. I mean. There are approaches, and uh, if I get a chance to uh, to apply one of these algorithms uh, on on these questions, I'll definitely do. But uh, I think for now it's uh, it's a good starting point um, to take this topic also into this uh, into the discussion in the macro environmental literature. Thanks. Yeah, I I, I agree that distributional aspects are really important and. Uh, uh, have maybe not always been highlighted enough. So, thanks. Thank, thank you, Then Philip, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, uh, thank you so much, Gerdian, uh, for, for, for your comments. And thank you also to, to Ulrich and, and Luis for, for your questions and comments as well. So, um, I'd like to, to start with, with uh, Gerdian's comments. So, um, especially two of this. Uh, um, first one, the uh, distinction, risk, uncertainty. So what, what you mentioned, risk in the sense of like uh, stochastic variance or uncertainty in the sense of some, some nineteen uncertainty. So, um, so I, I, I think that this is kind of related to, to what, what, I, what I also said in the beginning. So, I mean, the, the overall term transition risk itself is still kind of elusive and the definition isn't really Really, that 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 clear to us. So, I mean, the the, the approach that, that we took in, in this paper reflects how, how, how we think about it, and uh, is uh, in a sense guided by how we think um, the um, uh, the the, the market participants also also view it. Huh? Um, in some sense, I mean, we are we are we are measuring. I guess one could make a distinction, and we, we are not measuring transition risk per se, so as 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 a, as a level variable, but more like sudden changes in, in, in transition risk. Uh, so, uh, uh, so in a sense, like shocks to this, to this process. Um, um, but yeah, I, I agree so that this is this still kind of, kind of nebulous and, and, and worth, worth thinking of, uh, to think about that. And uh, regarding your, your, your second comment, so regarding this, this cause effect relationship, I'm, I have to admit, I'm, I'm not quite 100% sure what, what you meant with that. So, I mean, um, basically what, what we we're trying to, to achieve here by combining all this, these, these, these two approaches, was to kind of uh, stay relevant for what we're trying to measure here. So, I mean, as I, as I said, if we only took stock returns, then it would be an incredibly noisy uh, 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 shock time series. We get many, many false positives. Uh, well, if we'd only use news data, um, I mean, uh, if, if, you, if you look into the news, there's so much concerning climate change and economic impacts. You have, if Fridays for Future does something, you have uh, greater effects. Uh, so, um, this this wouldn't really be be really uh, on point if, if we only took um, uh, one one of one of these approaches separately. So um, yeah, so I, I I don't know did did, uh, did I get your, your comment correctly here? Or? Oh, you 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 sort of uh, uh, pick um, uh, events that are uh, uh, 
uh, have a high correlation. Am I correct? I mean, there's that? A so, event. please, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Is, okay, is, so, um, is that the, correct? Yes, I mean, correlation, like in the sense that we mm -hmm. require that in both for, in both sides, in both sources, uh, so both on the stock market in terms of like finance, real economy, but also like in the sense of awareness of information, uh, of the conveyance of information that there are some some sudden movements, that there's something new happening. Yeah? My My point is that correlation is not causation. Uh, yes, mm -hmm. and we are we are not claiming that that uh, mm -hmm. there's there's okay. two, uh, have have an effect on each other. So I mean, we we are kind of thinking of there's some exogenous outside process. Let's call it mm -hmm. transition risk. Yeah? And if there's a, a spike, then it it uh, manifests in in both these sources uh, at at the same time. Yeah? Okay. But that, okay. That, that's, that's what it, it, the a lot of. Yeah. That's a bit clear to me. Okay, um, and then I'd like also to, to address the, the comments by by Ulrich. So, and um, you asked uh, regarding the actual weather conditions. Um, so um, we didn't include those in our analysis. So we were only focused on, on uh, as I said, the, the uh, stock market returns and the uh, news cycle. Um, personally, I I think that if we actually look at at weather data, then we'd kind of uh, muddy things a little bit in terms that we might get a little bit more effects from from physical risk. I mean, if, if I if we look at weather data, if there's uh, heat wave, more shocks, hurricanes, all that stuff, that that uh, I, I personally associate that more with with an increase in in, in physical risk. Uh, I mean, of course, the, those two are not not independent. I mean, uh, high physical risk in some sense also implies uh, more transition risk uh, later down the road through more policy, more um, more action, all that stuff. Uh, but uh, in a sense, we think that uh, looking looking at, at uh, this physical data would would, would kind of uh, not be uh, the right way to go for for transition risk. I don't know uh, how, how you see it, but uh, yeah. No, I, I I agree. From from that perspective, uh, one should rather avoid it to to mix up those things. But personally, I would uh, I would argue that. Um, the individual perception of investors uh, might also be dependent on the weather. And mm -hmm. um, in a hot summer, you might be much more susceptible for yeah, reading news about uh, yeah, extreme weather events or climate change, climate policies. And that's why I think it could be worthwhile to at least try to uh, how it affects the results. Mm -hmm. Maybe not even taking explicitly whether on a daily basis or monthly basis into account, but rather maybe see if there are extreme episodes um, that can have an effect on the perceptions of these transition risks. So it's, mm -hmm. it can be somewhat a, a, subjective, a subjective measure of transition risk. And in that sense, um, this could yeah, probably help to isolate it a bit better. Mm -hmm. OK. Interesting perspective. I, we, we haven't thought of it this way. So thank you very much for, for this comment, and we we we'll look into that. Huh? Um, okay. So and the final comment by by Luis. Um, so regarding the the um, identification of those last two shocks. So yes, indeed, that is something that we've uh, also noticed. So uh, um, in in our paper, we have we have a, a list with, and also I guess in in the slide set in the appendix, uh, which I think will be shared afterwards. Uh, we have a, a list with, with the shocks that, that we identified along with like a description of what happened. And yes, we also saw this uh, first one, this first negative one as like the Trump uh, election and then the Trump inauguration uh, 2017. Um, that is something we are a little bit concerned about so that, that this might be that the, our, our negative shocks are a little bit too one-sided that are only from, from, from that source. And uh, we're, we are trying to uh, to, to uh, investigate this a bit more in detail during our, our robustness checks, also with, with, with other countries, if we uh, see similar uh, similar um, effects on like on industrial production or that sort of thing. But thank you very much for, for the comment. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for, for responding to comments. Since everyone was uh, very conscious of time, and we still have five minutes, I wanted to to check. Uh, for the last time, whether there are any questions from the audience to be expressed verbally rather than on the chat. So um, let me ask this question. And 
uh, wait a second for any hand raised or any voice taken. I see that uh, uh, that, uh, that the amount of knowledge and takeaways might have been, of course, uh, quite overwhelming. So, uh, so with, with this uh, with this remark, I wanted to thank all the, all the speakers and uh, discussants. Um, uh, I'm sure we need we need a break, which will be uh, 75 minutes, and uh, and next parallel session will reconvene half past one. Thank you very much again and, uh, and goodbye. Great, thank you. Thank Thanks you so much. Thank, thank you. you.